It's almost Halloween, and if you're in the process of planning a thriller night, a monster mash, or a season of The Witch, our very own music editor, Quam, has the perfect collection of spooky songs to populate your party playlist. Quam, tell us more about it. Thank you so much, David. Yes, the Spooky Season soundtrack is the one-stop shop for all of your horror needs. Our annual Halloween music curation will turn any home into the perfect haunted house. Are you looking for music that fits your horror subgenre of choice? Well, we have music for the supernatural, the undead, fans of the slasher, and so much more. And on the other hand, are you looking to choose your level of spookiness? Well, we have everything from mildly uncomfortable featuring T.R. Wax's very uncomfortable smile to Do Not Enter, which if you enter there, you're, you're going there on your own, on, on, on your own whim, okay? Be careful. Those music videos are scary. I would not recommend you going in there unless you have the heart for it. But I must say that my favorite aspect of this year's collection was actually inspired by our friend Audrey, and that is songs that are inspired by true crimes. And I didn't realize how many songs were actually inspired by crimes and just bad things that happen. And it took me down a rabbit hole, and I realized that some of my favorite songs were actually inspired by true crimes. And not necessarily, it's the song that I'm choosing to show y'all right now it's not necessarily inspired by a specific crime, but it's inspired by a situation that happens way too often. And it's actually very sad. And the, so the song itself is very pop and very happy. But once you start reading to the lyrics, it's actually telling a really grim tale. So let's play that song right now. Yes, that is Foster the People, Punked Up Kicks. This song was such a hit, and it's it, it's, not, it's not really hard to see why. I mean, the tune is very catchy. Uh, the beat is so uplifting, and it's, it's like oozes like pure fun. But the song is actually about uh, like a school shooter, and it's actually like the, one of the most like uh, like the most serious song you can possibly sing. And the fact that it was like you know controlling the radio waves when you know radio was still like very popular is 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 just remarkable. It just kind of shows that people do not listen to lyrics at all because the song kind of spells it out for you, even in the, the the chorus where you know they're saying like just run from my my gun and it's it's so it's so eerie when you like realize what the song's actually about and then you start tying it into like real life events. It's like oh, it just makes you feel really just like uneasy, which I think actually now that I'm thinking about it, really works to the song's benefit because it's one of those things that no one wants to talk about, but we kind of gloss over. But it's still very uneasy to talk about. So, yeah, Pumped Up Kids by the Foster, uh, Foster the People. Very uneasy song to listen to. It's spooky in a way that you're not expecting. Liz, did you want, have something to say? <laughs> no pressure, Liz. <laughs> but, yeah, like, I'm one of them, right? Like, I don't think that I paid attention to those lyrics when that song came out. And I remember, you know, bopping to it, too. And now... Uh, after listening to the lyrics, I can't believe that, you know, I didn't hear it before that. Like, you know, it the, just the references around around all of that. Like, how how did I miss it? Like, I feel, I feel really come at, but I feel like I deserve that because I didn't listen to those lyrics before. I just always assumed it was, you know, a metaphor for something else. Like, I was, I heard the lyrics, obviously, and because I used to sing them, but just assumed it was something uh, represented something else. I didn't think it was literal. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like terrifying that we we were bopping around to this massive hit that was talking about something um, so awful. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Definitely. I mean, and that kind of just like encompasses like you know like songs that are inspired by true crimes because you know like you the song the song will be so just like catchy and so just you know like such a, so much of an earworm that you don't even realize that it's being inspired or is, you know, telling the tale of something that's, like, very grim. Um, honestly, I kind of forget 
who is supposed to go next, but I'm just going to say David. Liz. <laughs> David. Yo, it's Liz. Liz. It's Liz. Yeah. Liz. I'll, I'll take it. Thanks. Actually, I I have a very similar type song where it was a, not necessarily a bop. It was, it sounded like something that it wasn't. So we'll talk about it after we hear it. Play the tape. Every breath you take. did we miss that this is not in fact a love song not sure how we missed it i mean people even played this at their wedding and when doing research people were coming up to sting and to the and to the band police and they're like you know we love this album and they're like wow they're like you know it was the most played song at our wedding and they couldn't believe it so this song back in 1983 sting um had just separated from his wife uh, who happens to be the best friend of the new girlfriend and to add insult onto injury, they lived on the same block. They were neighbors, right? So it was creepy and he admitted to it being creepy, right? But he was like, this is not a love song. This is about an obsessive stalker. And when you look at the video, you think to yourself, how did I miss it? They're in an abandoned building, tons of cigarettes. That means they've been there for a long time. They've got the guy cleaning the window. I mean, there's nobody in this place and he does not look happy. He doesn't look regretful like he like he misses somebody. I mean, he if you rewatch, go watch the video again. But if you watch it, I mean, he is like the camera, like into it, like I'm watching you every breath you take. You're not getting away. So it was very creepy. What are your thoughts? I mean, me personally, that, that last shot where he's just like, looks at the camera, I think that says it all. I mean, anyone who looks at me like that, I'm like, oh, he, he, clearly they're not showing signs of affection. Show, <laughs> clearly they're, they're showing signs of mental instability. So uh, I, I don't know how uh, y'all missed it. I mean, I'm a little too young for that song. I, mean, I know this song, but it, it, in hindsight, I don't know how, how that how Well, that you know this song. I do know, know this song. song because like they played because back in 1997, Puff Daddy took it and he took yeah. a riff from it and used it for I'll Be Missing You. And and even the band was surprised that like, this is what? Like it's doing well again? And uh, it's just interesting how everybody, you don't think you know the song until you hear it and you're like, oh yeah, I do know it. I've never seen the video for this song. This is the first time I've ever seen that video. I'm not necessarily a Sting fan. Um, but once you watch it, yeah, that stare right at the end, creepy sting staring right at us, like that, that tells a whole different story. Um, and I've definitely heard this played at, at weddings before, yeah. especially like old, like family weddings back in the nineties is one of those really romantic, like anything that like sting sang or, uh, was that, uh, um, all for one and all for love song that was, uh, uh, like one of the Three Musketeers songs that had like Rod Stewart and I think Sting and uh, Brian Adams, a lot of Brian Adams wedding songs. I wonder how many people I'd love to, to fund, I'd love to fund with some money, um, some research into how many people who got married to that song are now divorced. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna crowd, I'm gonna crowdsource some money to see if we can work that out. <laughs> Yeah, crazy. Good use of funds. Good use of funds, David. <laughs> David, what about so. you? You got a you um, got a title for us, a song I, for us. I do, and this is actually the one that kind of kicked all this off behind the scenes. Um, when Quam, Audrey, and I were re doing some research to talk about our favorite songs and our favorite guilty pleasure songs, um, and the one that just blew our minds was a 1998 song called "The Way" by Fastball. If you don't remember it, here's a clip. Yeah, 
So The Way reached number one on multiple billboard charts in the summer of 1998, including the rock chart or the modern rock chart, where it was number one for seven weeks. And it was one of those songs you played with the car windows down and the summer breeze blowing through your hair. You were doing one of these in the wind, you know, out the window. <clears throat> but did you know the absolutely haunting story behind the song's lyrics. On June 29th, 1997, 88-year-old Raymond Howard and his 83-year-old wife, Leela, left their home in Salado, Texas to attend a music festival less than 20 miles from their home. Raymond had recently suffered a stroke and Leela was showing early signs of Alzheimer's, but the couple attended the festival every year, so their family thought, no big deal. Three days later, the couple was stopped by a sheriff's deputy for driving with their headlights off 500 miles away in Arkansas. When the Howard's family alerted police to their disappearance back in Texas, officers searched their home to find that they had left their hearing aids behind, they left their cat behind with no food or water, and had unplugged all of their appliances in the home. They even had their calendar up and it was turned to February, even though it was June. Um, they had also apparently left folded clothes behind on their bed, presumably for the trip, but they didn't pack it. And then on July 12th, less than two weeks after they were last seen, the Howard's Oldsmobile was found at the bottom of a 25-foot cliff in Arkansas with the couple dead with it. Uh, police estimate that the car was traveling at 50 miles per hour when it drove off the cliff. There were no skid marks found to suggest they even attempted to stop. Shortly afterwards, fastball singer and songwriter Tony Scalzo, who is from Texas, was inspired to write The Way after seeing a headline that read, quote, elderly Salado couple missing on trip to nowhere. And now when you go back to listen to the song and listen to those lyrics, uh, where were they going without even knowing the way? It's a whole different and frankly, really, really depressing experience and kind of important like in wild to believe that like we were all bopping to this in the summer of 1998 thinking it was just a fun road trip song um really really brutal and as i was writing it i was like this is going to be a really depressing segment <laughs> <laughs> you know what and i you guys will come at me for this and i guess um and i guess that's all right you, we, we all are entitled to our opinions i Go think it's it. a little bit romantic if i'm being honest with you <laughs> that, that this, couple, this couple was like all right what's happening to us i don't know right i don't think it was obviously I, it wasn't an accident the way that people you know think that it may have been an accident um could have been planned but they were probably at just a point in their lives where they're like hey what do we have to lose at this point? Let's just go and have the trip of our lives. We'll buy whatever we need when we get there. I don't want to hear anything or anybody. It doesn't matter. We don't need these hearing aids. Let's just go. I find it a little liberating. Yes, a little romantic too, but you know, maybe, maybe because I've been married for so long too. I, I get it. I feel it. Yeah. yeah. There, was, there was definitely like a lot of rumors and speculation as to whether uh, they, they did kind of know what they were doing. Um, at the end, but I, only two people know for sure. But yeah. um, the song definitely like romanticizes it a little bit. Sure. Um, Kwame, I don't know if you remember this song. No, I don't. I mean, when Audrey showed it to us, it was definitely the first time I've heard this song. Um, but I think something that we are seeing recurring happen is that the depressing songs that <laughs> shouldn't be, you know, number one hits just somehow become number one hits, regardless of, you know, the, the, the dark background behind it. Because with each one of our songs, they all turn out to be, you know, uh, either top 10 or number one hits. So yeah. it's actually kind of kind of creepy, kind of creepy if you really think about it. Goes to show you, it doesn't even matter what you say, honestly. It is all about the musicality and the fact that they had 
amazing, you know, beats. They were catchy. They were, they, they knew what they were doing for sure. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, you can check out all the songs we just talked about and more creepy, real life inspired bops uh, and everything else you need to create the perfect Halloween soundtrack by saying Halloween music into your voice remote.